morning everyone and welcome to today's State of the Service Roadshow event. My name is Phil Lancaster and I work at the Australian Public Service Commission here in Canberra. Today's event has a very different look and feel to our usual approach to this event series, but I very much hope that you'll find the next 70 minutes or so informative and engaging and perhaps even inspiring. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the, the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land here in Canberra that I'm speaking from this morning. I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on whose country you are participating from, as well as their, to their elders and any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who might be participating in today's event. Before I get into the detail of today's event, did you know that the APS as an institution has its own presence on social media? So if you're interested in keeping up to speed on things across the service, I'd encourage you to follow us on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter and on Instagram. Details of, uh, of those platforms are coming up on the screen now. So this is a whole series of events right across Australia, starting with a Canberra launch event which took place in February and it took place in the former House of Representatives chamber in Old Parliament House in Canberra. Video from that event is available on the APS website, APSC website, and I do encourage you to check it out if you have a moment. At that event, you'll hear from the Honourable Ben Morton MP, Assistant Minister to the Minister for the Public Service, addressing the APS on the great work that was done throughout 2020, and also announcing details about the new APS Academy and the upcoming APS exhibition at the Museum of Australian Democracy. There's also a presentation from APS Commissioner Peter Woolcott on the state of the service in 2020. We've also had a number of state-based events and it's been really great to see the strong engagement from APS colleagues thus far around Australia. We usually do face-to-face -face events, so a purely virtual approach is not our preference, but there's no doubt that it has enabled many more people to participate. And to complement today's event, you can also find state-based statistical slideshows on the state of the service on the APSC website. Today's event will be in two parts. Firstly, we'll have a Q&A session with Mary Wiley-Smith, Deputy Australian Public Service Commissioner. And uh, Mary's going to answer questions submitted by the virtual audience via Slido. We'll then move to the second part of the event, which is a panel discussion on the topic of spirit of service. We have three of our Victoria-based colleagues who've agreed to talk a little bit about what it means for them to be APS employees and to give some personal reflections on the last 12 months. Then we'll go to a Q&A session with that panel where the panellists will answer some pre-prepared questions, but also questions submitted from the online audience via Slido. That's it for the introductions. I'm very pleased to welcome Deputy Commissioner Mary Wiley-Smith to answer your questions as part of this first Q&A session. So let's uh, move to the first one, which is um, the one that's had the most upvotes, which is real, and there've been a couple of others uh, which have come through talking about, asking about flexible work. So the question there is, can you please clarify the approach to flexible work arrangements for the APS going forward? there seem to be different approaches across different agencies. And Mary, I think you touched on this when you spoke about the link between engagement and flexible work. Yeah. So thanks, Phil, and thank you to whoever um, asked that question. Um, so flexible work is still the responsibility of an agency head, um, how their, their staff um, operate and what works for that particular agency. And an agency head takes into consideration um, what kind of IT system they have and what the load can be if people are working flexibly and outside the office. There's also a recognition of the type of work that's undertaken. And so it will, it will fit easily with some responsibilities and types of work and not so much with others. And so I should just say at the outset that agency heads still have that responsibility to make the decision for the agencies and how much flexible work they have going forward. However, at an APS whole, um, we are actually talking about 
flexible work and what does it mean for the future. We talk about it in the workforce strategy that I've just mentioned. But I'm also the deputy chair on what we call the Chief Operating Officer Committee, which sits just underneath the Secretary's board. Um, and the Chief Operating Officer Committee is looking at what does flexible work look like going forward for the whole of the APS. Um, and what are the opportunities and what are the, what are the, some of the challenges that we might have with flexible work. There's been a lot of work looking at productivity from working from home um, and what this might mean and a lot of agencies are embracing it to its fullest extent. For us in the public service, we've been pretty good. We've always had around 20% of public servants working flexibly um, and so now it's um, we, we assume that it's going to actually increase. One of the things that we're very, um, in the Chief Operating Officer Committee, very aware of is that the private sector are doing it, the banks are doing it, um, some of the state governments are doing it. And so for us in attracting staff, um, it's going to be pretty important that we also have a strong, um, what we call employee value comp um, proposition, and that um, we are competitive in the marketplace. So in the longer term, we do have to think about how we actually manage um, our workforce into the future and flexible work will have to actually be a strong component of what we do um, just to even be, um, be able to compete in the marketplace for talent. Um, we have to take it seriously and look at what we can do. So um, hopefully I've answered that question. It's basically we're all looking at it. We know we have to do it into the future. We're trying to work together as a whole APS, but at the end of the day, the responsibility for what actually happens within an agency is that agency head's responsibility. Thanks, Mary. Um, so another question that has uh, come up to the top of the list there is about trust in government. So um, trust in government has improved, and you, you mentioned the, the figures on that, Mary, but this person is commenting that it still seems low in absolute terms. So what does the APS need to do to improve further, do you think? Yeah. So, um, so the trust in government figures are quite low, um, but that's actually, compared to what's happening overseas, I think that's quite normal. Um, there, is a, the, there is something here, though, for us that we just need to, to realise. So trust in government is about all governments um, within the country. And when we're talking about trust in public services, that's about the public services within the country. So what we do has a direct link to both, but in particular the trust in the, the public service. For governments, we know that if we continue to provide good services and advice and um, are responsive to the community, that the, that, that trust kind of um, increases. And so we have to be really mindful of that. Um, and for public servants, it's, it's about going about the job that we've always done, um, which is we support in a political way the government of the day and that we also support the community and make sure that we are responsive and are listening to their needs and um, can do the best job that we can, no matter what, you know, where we work. So for people in Canberra, it's kind of the best advice that you can, going to government um, and policy advice. And um, for people in regions, most of the time it, you've got much more direct engagement with the, with the community. And so that's where the rubber really hits the road because that's where they actually make a decision on, um, you know, on how the APS is tracking. Thanks, Mary. Um, we've also got a question about the APS Academy. How will staff be able to participate in the Academy? Will it be generally open to staff across the APS or will it be dependent on managerial approval? Are there any, is there any further details you can provide on that at this point? So the Academy, um, so we, we will manage the Academy here and um, our, our offers will be open to everybody. Um, and you know, we, we want to make sure that we reach the most people in the APS that we possibly can. But in terms of what happens in your own department and how your department manages their training bucket and their approval processes, I'm probably not well placed to answer that. Um, we would certainly, from the APSC and from the core, be encouraging everybody can, um, can use the training. Um, but you just have to be mindful of whatever the arrangements are within your own particular department. And a question that's related to that is about uh, how people from who, who are outside Canberra can access the academy, given that its base will be physically here in the ACT. Yeah. So one of the things that um, 
Minister Morton made really clear when he had the discussion here in Canberra about the academy um, was that while it might be a bricks and mortar institution here, um, it's basically going to be ensuring, we have to ensure that it has to reach all of the public service. And for us, about only 37%, I think, of public servants are in Canberra. So we are very mindful that we have to be able to deliver courses remotely um, and in other kind of major um, towns and cities and capitals where we have um, large groups of public servants. And we also have to have pretty good virtual and kind of e-learning opportunities as well. And so we're quite mindful of that. Um, Indeed, even now, like we'd love to be with you um, today in Victoria, um, but because of, we've had a few states, including Victoria, which have also had more recent lockdowns, we decided not to. And the academy will be a bit the same. Um, where, where we can, we'll come out and we'll actually engage with people directly and offer our courses um, in your location. And where we ha are restricted, then we'll make sure that we have really good online options for you. Okay, a couple of questions about the surge reserve. So firstly, someone asking um, how, what is the nomination process? How do people nominate to be part of the reserve? Uh, but then a, a related one is what about the operating model for the reserve, which will it be a virtual workforce? And I guess the implied in that is, or will people be required to, to physically relocate to so to, what to I might do is, so I haven't been involved in how to nominate for the Surge Reserve, um, but we do have a lot of people here that organise and manage it. So what we will do is, on that question, we'll come back out to everybody online today and confirm how to nominate and give you the links um, and um, the process within your own department. So we will, we will do that and make sure that you get that information. Um, in terms of how the Surge Reserve would be utilised, um, so it depends on the nature of the crisis and what that department might need, or it could even be, for example, what a state government might need. In some instances, um, even now, with surging between departments, we can see some people can do it virtually because of the nature of the role and the type of work that they're doing, and others um, have needed to go into a different department and sit within um, their department to be able to assist with the, the work. So an example is Services Australia. When the 2,000 people went out to assist, it was actually in person. And so they all had to, to, to go out. A lot of them were out here at Tuggeranong and Canberra. Um, but there are other instances where we've had, including here at the APSC, where we've had people that have surged in to assist us um, in managing the service through 2020. And we've been able to do that virtually. So it just depends on the nature of the, of the request to the search. Okay. Um, so there's a, a question here. Actually, I think we've already answered about um, whether we risk losing high performers given that private sector jobs are available almost everywhere. And will the APS move to most positions being available anywhere? I think you've touched on that in talking about the employee value proposition yeah. aspect of flexible work. Um, but uh, thinking of job retention and retaining um, the, the really important skills that the APS requires, there's a question here about what the APS will do to ensure we retain highly trained engineering and technical staff. And perhaps that's in relation to the, the, the comment um, in your presentation about Victoria having the highest proportion of those job roles yeah. um, in, the, in the APS. So yes, um, look, we're looking at a number of um, areas where we need highly trained staff and thinking about how we develop a career path for them and continue to um, grow them within the APS. And so that's why we've announced the professions model, which is something that we've kind of copied a little bit from the UK. Um, but it's where you actually need that deep expertise and you need to build that capability within the service. Um, and keep it. Um, so we're starting the professions model at the moment with the you know, digital data and also um, strategic HR um, because we know that we've got issues with you know, highly trained people in the digital and data space and we want to keep them for the service and so we're going to trial this going forward and it could be expanded to other areas of the APS as we go forward. Okay. Um, look, there's a question here, Mary, which has come up, and it comes up quite frequently about labour hire and contractors. Yeah. Um, 
and the prevalence of labour hire and contractors. Is there anything that you can you can say about about that? It, it's a difficult question, and but it is one that, that so, comes up from time to time. Yeah, this one. So I, I it's easy, so it's one that comes up time to time, but it's it's a one that's actually should just um, we should talk about um, because there are a lot of um, lots of concern about. Um, labour hire firms and contractors. We see it in the media every day. We've also got a, um, a Senate inquiry here in Canberra that I'll be, I'm preparing for, um, and w where I'm sure this issue is going to come up. It's on our workforce. And look, um, number one, I would just say to everybody, you're always going to have contractors and you're always going to have labour for hire. They are actually um, forms of, um, Forms of, you know, basically being able to get in resources to assist and capability when you need it that are endorsed and basically there's room for this in the in our own public service act. It talks about it, so that you're always going to have it. The question I think is about what kind of roles they do and what the mix is of contractors, labour hire, and the private uh, and the public service. Um, one area where we see a lot of labour hire and contractors in is in ICT, and um, and that's something that you know we are collectively as an APS concerned about because we want to make sure that we also have the capability within that space and public servants that are then able to make informed choices when they do go out to the market, and to do that you need the expertise in house as, um, before you actually go out to the market. So that's a pretty important area that we are all looking at at the moment. Um, but you're always going to have a bit of a mix. Um, most of the time labour hire and contractors are used um, in short term um, kind of areas where you need to build capability and where you don't have people um, for the longer term. But I know that that doesn't always work like that in practice. But um, but I would say we're just going to have to deal with labour hire and contractors in the APS. But what our executives of every agency need to be really aware of is how they use them and where they're located because you need to still have capability within the service and so you don't want to erode that in any area. Mm. Thanks, Mary. Um, look, I'm conscious of time, so I think we should probably just go to one last question, uh, which is really a, a future, a forward-looking question. What does the new APS normal look like? Our response to the challenges of 2020 has been great, but is, unlike, but is likely unsustainable in the longer term. Yeah. So um, I'd love to have a crystal ball and know what the new APS normal is going to look like. Um, but I can talk about, um, so, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can talk about what I'd like to see and what some of my colleagues would like to see in the future because I think um, that's important to start talking about these types of issues. I'd love to see an APS where we work as a whole of government. And so we can see through the surge reserve, we can see through what's happened during COVID, that people just mobilised to help each other out. It didn't matter whether you were in ATO or Services Australia or Defence or Treasury. Um, if someone needed assistance within the service, we saw this huge mobility and people helping one another out. And I'd like to see that continue. I also saw increased collaboration, um, particularly at the senior levels of the service and indeed even in the, the Chief Operating Officer Committee that I was on, um, which meant that um, things got done faster. Um, we tackled issues together. We solved problems. The normal kind of um, red tape bureaucracy that you would have to um, go through to get things done kind of disappeared. And I, I'd love that into the future because um, I really don't like lots of red tape. Um, so I think if, you know, people that came to work and that they felt that their work was meaningful um, and they were able to actually go home satisfied and happy that they'd done something that was fantastic today is kind of what we want, which for me means also that people need to be empowered. And I suspect that um, one of the things that we'll be looking at in the near future is the classification of the public service and how we're structured. Um, it was a recommendation from, that the government accepted from the Thodi review of the public service. And so I expect that we might have a more streamlined levels also within the service, which means that um, the hierarchy doesn't necessarily dominate and people are working in teams where they feel empowered and that their voices are heard and they are engaged. And I think that's pretty important. And in the ways of working, I do think we're going to have much more flexible work. And, uh, 
And while some agencies it might not be possible at the moment because of their IT systems or what they're working on, I suspect there, there will be pressure from the marketplace to enable it to happen in the future because everybody else is, ha is heading in that way. And I'd like to see public servants be able to live where they work. Um, so if someone, or work where they live, I should say. So you don't necessarily have to be in one of the capital cities to be able to contribute and to be part of the Australian Public Service. So that's my kind of ideal for the future. Um, and if you can, um, hopefully you might be able to help us get there as well by supporting some of these types of things. Because for me, it, I think it just makes good sense. Um, but thanks, Phil, and thanks everybody for having me today. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck for 2021 and enjoy the next session with the panellists. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary. And um, thanks for your for being candid and, and, and you know, very open in the way that you answered those questions. So, um, yeah, I'm, I, and I do apologise that we had to draw things to a close. There were lots of other questions coming through on Slido. As I said before, we will do our best to, to pull out the key themes from those questions and find a way to, to put that information, the answers to those questions out um, to people who've participated in these roadshow events, but then also more broadly to the, to the APS workforce. There was a question also that came through about a transcript for today's event, and I can confirm that a transcript will be available, the video and transcript and the presentation will be available in due course on the APSC website. Okay, we're now going to move to the second um, element of this morning's event, which is the panel discussion. Now, Mary, in her uh, remarks, she touched on the core role of the APS as being serving the government of the day and serving the community. And that links in really nicely with our panel discussion, which the topic for our panel discussion is the spirit of service. Now, there were lots of questions on Slido we haven't addressed, but we're now going to wipe, they'll all be archived, but we're going to wipe the, the sort of the interface, the, the visible interface, so that we've got a clean slate in advance of the panel discussion. But please, um, as the panellists are talking, please don't hesitate to submit questions either for individual panellists or for the panel as, as a whole. Um, we're going to have a, a bit of a pre, we've got some pre-prepared questions and then we'll move into the, the audience Q&A using Slido. But first, um, let me introduce our panellists. So firstly, we have David Weymouth, who's joining us from Geelong, where he's responsible for managing the National Data Acquisition Centre for the Australian Bureau of Statistics. The National Data Acquisition Centre was launched about five years ago to bring together the collection of data for all of the ongoing business and household surveys that are undertaken by the ABS. David has been with the ABS for more than 20 years. He's worked across a number of business areas within the organisation. And before Geelong, he was actually living and working in Western Australia. So welcome, David, and thanks for joining us. Secondly, we have Simone Keenan, who's joining us from the Bureau of Meteorology in Melbourne, where she is the general manager with responsibility for organisational development. Simone's been in that role for just over 18 months now. So obviously, Simone, you came in just before bushfires and, uh, and COVID-19, so you chose a great time to, to, to join the APS. Um, but prior to that, Simone held senior people and culture roles in the Victorian Public Service, in the health and emergency port services portfolios. And she also spent more than 10 years in the education sector. And our third panellist is Paul Henderson, who's joining us from Bendigo, where he works for Oz Industry, which is the specialist business program delivery division in the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Paul is Oz Industry's regional manager for Northern Victoria. He's worked with many micro and SME businesses over the last 20 years, and 10 of those have been with the Commonwealth Government through Oz Industry. Paul's main focus in regional Victoria is on developing connections and building knowledge about the needs of business communities and the techniques needed to create economic growth. He also has experience in ICT, community development, printing, event management, and telecommunications. So welcome, Paul, and welcome, indeed, to all three of our panellists. So 
first up, oh, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to briefly reflect on the topic of spirit of service. Because the, the, the purpose of the panel discussion today is, is really to showcase, it's to highlight the breadth, the, the diversity of roles that exists within the APS and the ethos of service that underpins all of those, all of those different roles. So um, I might start, might start with Paul. Paul, if you could just give us your sort of personal perspective on this topic of spirit of service. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Phil. Um, it's uh, an interesting topic and uh, put a bit of thought into it. And I guess uh, you've given a little bit of background. We work in regional Australia as a regional manager. I'm in northern Victoria. And, and being out here, we're able to help businesses with programs and support access um, information to grow their business um, and really helping them sometimes in their most vulnerable and sometimes when the business is, uh, is struggling or impacted by a disaster, and we've seen a few of those. You know, we've had in my region particularly, I guess, floods, drought, more recently fires, and of course COVID. Um, so we're able to help businesses because I think as, as APS, we're well connected, we're independent and impartial, and, and businesses see us as, uh, as being that, and they can talk to us about where they're at with their business and build that trust. And as, I, as an APS person in a regional area, we're often the only one that they have any personal interaction with. And they're often very happy to see us face to face. And I know Mary mentioned trust in government, and I find that you know the businesses we deal with really have a high, much higher level of trust in government than perhaps the survey indicated, because you know we have that ability. But I think part of that being involved with the APS is we've got the confidence because we know we're well supported. You know, we're well. There's a great team of uh, people around management, outstanding network of people that we can call on. And if there's you know, people on here today that you, that we'll talk to so, soon, but also across all levels of, of the APS, um, there's an amazing array of skills, and importantly, I think a culture of everyone wants to help. So whenever there's an issue, you can pick up the phone you know that there's someone there that's really keen to, to help you and to help the business at the other end. And I think that's a really important aspect of the APS. Um, we're not always in the same room or the same state, but you know, in general, we all really share a desire, I think, to make a difference and really improve the lives of, of people. So um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's my take on it, Phil. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. David, I might, uh, might throw to you. What's your personal perspective on this topic of spirit of service? Cheers, thanks for that, Phil. Um, so for me, the spirit of service is that piece that's really fundamental to being a public servant where um, what we're really involved in is delivering value to the community, um, to the public, to government, um, and helping improve things in general. So um, at a, a broader level, the response of the public sector to COVID-19 is a really good example of um, how the spirit of service comes into play, where we enabled um, delivery of services across government um, and we also rallied really quickly in terms of releasing people from a number of agencies to achieve those outcomes. Within the ABS certainly um, there was recognition that the data that we were producing was really critical for government and the public to understand what was happening as a result of COVID-19. And we really rapidly deployed a couple of bespoke collections associated with um, understanding what was going on for households and what was under, under sorry, what was happening for businesses. And um, we deployed those incredibly quickly and they were able to give a touch point for the community and for government around what was happening um, out there in the real world. At the same time, we were also pulling together a whole range of brand new outputs um, that came from a whole range of sources of data that we already had possibly, um, and some that we were bringing in brand new from administrative services. So things like other government agencies and businesses and bringing those sorts of that data in and providing insights to government about what was happening um, as a response to COVID-19. And that helped to provide some guidance for government around what they would respond. I think at a really personal level for me as a Victorian, I think the, the spirit of service really came across with seeing colleagues continuing to work in what was 
incredibly demanding um, environment. And you know, I'm really thankful that um, being in Geelong, I was outside of the Ring of Steel, but I had day-to-day -day interactions with colleagues that were working and living in Melbourne and dealing with that. And seeing them persevere through that um, on the basis of wanting to deliver outcomes again for the public and for government was incredible. And I really think that that's the sort of thing that demonstrates what the spirit of service is for me. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. And, and I, um, oh, David, I mean. And uh, I think it's sort of, in a sense, it's the elephant in the room, isn't it? The, 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 the experience of Victoria over the, the last eight to nine months is something which is, has been very different from, from the rest of Australia. And it's something which clearly, based on what you've just said, has brought that, that home to you and I imagine to other APS employees in a really tangible way. So thanks for mentioning that. Um, lastly, Simone, oh, this initial question, spirit of service, you've only been in the APS for you know, 18 months, but you've, you've obviously got a, a background within the public sector more broadly. What, what, is spirit of, what does spirit of service mean to you? Yeah, thanks very much, Phil. Um, yeah, look, I think um, from David and Paul, you know, their perspective is spot on. But I suppose for me, um, you know, it is about, about the impact that one can have on the lives of others. And it's sometimes easy to forget that. Um, I think when we're getting caught up in the bureaucracy and administrative burden of our roles, and certainly from my point of view, it's not all about major crises or significant acts of service. It's also about the daily acts that support others to make decisions, which can sometimes be life changing. It might be farmers deciding if they want to harvest or builders deciding if they commence work, a community event being cancelled, um, a fisherman going out to fish for the day. Everyone at the Bureau contributes in some shape or form to the quality of weather information and informed decision making and the customer experience. So the Bureau provides a service that is part of people's everyday lives and Australia rely on us to provide, you know, that, that information in order to keep them safe and stay informed. So it's, it's, it, it definitely impacts me every day when I think about the contribution. Um, so yeah, as an agency or department of the APS, I think it's easy to get caught up in the everyday. However, the spirit of service is remembering the service itself. Um, in everyday interactions. Great, thanks, Simone. And look, I think just in that, those three initial sort of sets of comments, we've seen something of the breadth of, of the APS, haven't we? From, from businesses to builders and farmers and fishermen through to, you know, the whole of Australia trying to make sense of the COVID-19 response using data. So, um, that's actually been a really nice, I guess, introductory piece and very, illustrative of exactly how far the reach of the APS extends into the lives of, of, of people in the community. Um, so I'll come back to you straight away, Simone. Um, you've only you've been in the APS for 18 months. What prompted you to join the APS? Yeah, look, I, you know, as part of the Victorian public um, sector, and so I, I saw it as a, a natural transition, and I really liked the idea of being part of a federal approach and a national effort. Um, certainly the Bureau has a strong brand and reputation and it was something that I was really interested in supporting. Um, and I do like being held to high standards and I think that that's what the APS um, demands in terms of impartiality and accountability, for example. And those things are really important to me. And I'm always really inspired and motivated um, by people who act in the best interests of others and drive the conversation and policy for change and greater good. So I think there's just a lot to embrace. Um, so yeah, I, I was really comfortable putting my hand up for this gig and I'm really pleased to be part of um, the APS. It's great. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, David, what about you? What, what prompted you to join the APS? I joined the APS as a graduate and um, being really blunt about it, I wanted to do something more with my arts degree than driving a truck around um, Melbourne and Geelong dropping off shoes. Uh, and the APS gave me an opportunity to do that. And it also gave me a really rich career um, that built from 
um, initially working in a, a policy area for what was then um, Department of Social Security. I joined the ABS and I worked across economic statistics. I built a career around um, providing consulting services to state government, worked in the technology area as a technologist, um, worked in account management in WA, worked on census in WA, and are now back over east um, getting the data through the door. And um, so it was really the connection of those things and the ability to have a fulsome career that delivered value back into public that really drove that and kept me in the public service. Excellent. Um, although at the outset it was just that you could find a job with an arts degree. <laughs> I've got an arts degree, I'm, I'm, so that, that's my... <laughs> that is, uh, that's something of my story as well in a sense, you know, when you yeah, when you have an arts degree majoring in French and applied linguistics, what do you, what, what can you do? Well, you, the, the, the public service has an amazing array of, of opportunities. So, um, so yeah, that's great. Thanks for, and you know what we had a, in our, at our launch event, we had a deputy secretary from PM&C who said exactly the same thing. When this question was put to her, what prompted her to join the APS? It was because they offered her a job. And, um, and all she had was an arts degree. So I think that's, a, that's an important thing to put out there and, and be mindful of. And, um, okay, lastly, Paul. Do you have an arts degree, Paul? Yeah, no arts degree here, Phil. No, oh, okay. sorry, not an arts at all. Um, I'm probably, uh, in, I never really uh, planned to join the APS, of course, like most, I suppose. Um, I was working for um, a not-for-profit community organisation back in the noughties and I had some involvement with Oz Industry um, through that they funded the role that I was in, but uh, one of my uh, managers at that, in that organisation later went on to join um, the APS. And fast forward like 10 years and he asked me to apply for a slightly different um, regional role under Enterprise Connect and the role looked really exciting and really, um, you know, the next level of what I'd been working on. So I thought that's a great, great opportunity. So I applied and I was lucky to get the role and so uh, that led me to the APS rather than anything else, so the, the type of role and, and what was offered. Um, yeah, so Excellent. yeah, I've got, it's not a very exciting you know, arts degree journey, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been really great. Excellent. Um, okay, so the next question I'm, I'm gonna put, and I, I'm conscious of time, and we've already got some questions coming through on Slido, so I might not put this question to each of our panelists. I might just go back to you, um, to you, Paul. What's been your proudest moment during your APS career so far? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, again, there's been a lot of, of proud moments and, and some bigger things, I guess. Uh, I, was, I was at Medcon, uh, Australia's only mask manufacturer, this time 12 months ago, and uh, thinking of what, what's possible to, to ramp up the mask production in Australia pretty quickly through, through COVID. And, and just to see what uh, was able to be done with the APS, working with this local manufacturer and um, another engineering firm and the Defence Force was uh, pretty exciting. And they've obviously done some really great stuff with the mask manufacturing. But that's, you know, that's a sort of a bigger story. But for me, it's the little things. It's when you talk to a business um, or an organisation whom, you, whom you've helped in the past, and the next time you see you, they, they want to thank you. They just can't be more appreciative of the work you've done or the, the service you've helped them with. You know, we couldn't have done it without you sort of comments. Uh, those sort of things I think are the really proud ones because they're the, they're the reason we're out here in regional areas helping businesses and helping those organisations to achieve. And so really great when, when we get that feedback and we get that, you know, quite a bit. That's, that's terrific. Hmm, excellent. Um, what about you, David? What's your proudest moment in the APS? Uh, well, for me, yeah, um, I think my pride generally comes around the response of my teams to adversity. So um, certainly last year, the teams that we have working here all responded incredibly well to what was happening with COVID-19, with lockdown, with changes to the way we operate. Um, and that was a real challenge for everyone. And um, the other reflection I have is um, that in looking after the WA census in 2016, I'm sure everyone's aware there were uh, issues in with the census in 
2016, but the, the fact that that team picked themselves up after um, what we went through and delivered what was an incredible outcome for the WA community and the government more broadly and getting an incredibly good census result. You know, th those are the sorts of things that I find a lot of pride in as a public servant. Excellent. Thanks for that. Simone, a slight, slightly different question for you, which is about um, how you've managed you know, your own resilience when, work, when faced with difficult work situations. Obviously, you, you've come into the, the, the APS just in time for the bushfires and COVID crisis, and I know that the Bureau of Meteorology played a huge role in, in helping to manage, um, manage bushfire, the bushfire situations across Australia uh, Across uh, last bushfire se season, so how yeah how have you managed your own resilience in those really testing circumstances? Yeah, thanks very much, Phil. Um, I suppose I'd, I'd define um, you know uh, difficult work situations and resilience coming to the fore in terms of those more complex people issues or circumstances that may have an adverse impact on an employee's well-being and mental health. And bushfires is a really good example of that in terms of the fatigue um, of our operational staff and that cumulative impact um, from just being on the front line like that. So certainly psychological safety and the ability to provide forums for people to speak up and contribute um, is imperative. Um, look, I think, you know, um, from my own personal perspective and resilience, you know, I've learned that having balance and boundaries is really important. Um, you know, simple things like quality sleep, being mindful around um, alcohol consumption, eating the right food, um, exercising, all pretty cornerstone, I suppose, to maintaining personal resilience and well-being um, and to deal with tough situations. And, you know, I would take it further and suggest that mental health support and programs um, that now extend beyond that sort of standard EAP, um, including at the senior leadership level, are really, really important. Um, I've learnt that partnering more deeply with individuals, um, given that every single person's um, situation is quite different and needs to be contextualised, um, is absolutely necessary. And I think the importance of having one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations with your line manager so that you can maintain that shared understanding of expectations. Um, that's obviously critical. Um, and the last thing I would add is taking leave. Um, you know, sometimes people prefer to save their leave or, or not take leave because they think that things will fall apart if they, they sort of take a couple of days out. But I think, you know, it's there for you to rest and recover. And so taking leave is really essential, essential to being a high functioning employee. So I would definitely, um, you know, share that as part of my learning and part of my strategy to remain resilient, really. Mm. Excellent. Thanks for that, Simone. I think it's really interesting to have those insights from more of that, from that organisational um, development and management perspective. And that comment on taking leave is a, uh, is a very interesting one because I think there can be a perception, maybe people like the perception that they're too important to be absent from the workplace, but, um, but it is such an important part of, of, of managing, as you've said, managing our own ability to continue to, to contribute. Look, there's lots of, lots of questions coming through from Slido, so I might actually, um, we might actually move to uh, to the, a couple of those questions now, even though we, ha we had a couple of other pre-prepared ones, but let's, let's move to the Slido questions. And the first one is about um, sustaining the spirit of service across your team during, um, during the COVID response, during work, remote working and dispersed working. So how did you, were there any particular strategies that you brought in to sustain that spirit of service? And I guess we could say sustain that engagement across dispersed or remote teams. And um, David, we might, uh, we might throw to you first on that one. Thanks, Phil. Um, so we did a number of things within the agency and um, some very specific things within the division. Um, and within the division, one of the things we did for the exec team, so that was the EL2s and the SES, so myself, um, another band one and our band two, was to have initiated daily stand-ups at you know, nine o'clock in the morning that were relatively short and provided a degree of connection. And um, 
whilst we started them initially focused around just the, the business that we were undertaking, what we found was it generated um, significant connection amongst that cohort and got us talking about things um, a bit more informally that helped to provide connection to each other and to what was going on. It also allowed us to um, vent collectively and share the real challenges that we were facing and look at ways of moving forward with that. Um, we also encouraged that within our team. So um, we had teams having stand-ups and or larger connections. And we did things like running a monthly um, Q&A session with the SES across the entire division where we had an opportunity to talk about um, what was going on and what was really relevant at the time and to take questions and answer those at the time. So a number of things that helped try and keep people engaged with what was going on in the workplace whilst recognising the difficulties they were going through. Yeah, okay. Do you, th there's another question actually which is related to this, which is about tailoring strategies for Victorian-based teams. Um, do you have anyone reporting to you who's outside Victoria, David, or are, all of, are you really just focused on that, that centre in Geelong? Um, my team is, is pretty much in Geelong, except that I also am responsible for a workforce of about 400 field interviewers across the country that normally go into homes and undertake face-to-face -face interviews. And um, we found that, um, well, certainly with COVID-19, initially there was no unknown people were going to be doing that. And we wanted to have a really strong connection to that workforce. Um, so again, went through a process of having um, teleconferences and to a certain extent, later on in the day, um, some remote VCs with, with that workforce to try and connect more directly with them. And that was something that had never been done before. So that was, it's not really a, a Victorian perspective, but it, it represents the whole need to connect across the country. Hmm. Simone, I might, I might go to you on, on that particular question, because obviously the Bureau of Meteorology has staff right across Australia. Um, did you notice, was there anything specific that you had to do for your Victorian based staff that, that, that was particularly tailored to the specific circumstances that, that were taking place in Victoria? Yeah, look, it, it's, it's a really good question. It was a real um, challenge for us. Um, you know, we rely on all of our people leaders to, you know, really embrace the capability of that role and do the check-ins, keep the engagement up. And certainly from a Victorian point of view, um, there was lots of encouragement just to do those regular check-ins, have those forums in which to enable others to speak up, talk about the challenge of homeschooling versus trying to get work done and get online. Um, you know, it was just about keeping, keeping those lines of communication open, um, making sure that allowances were being made and that we were as flexible as possible with our people knowing the stress that they were under. Um, you know, I really take my hat off to everybody that was homeschooling and that went on for Victorian staff for quite some time. So, you know, it, it was an ongoing challenge, but it was just the regular engagement and communication um, to what David said, really, yeah. Mm. Okay, Paul. What about what about you in Northern Victoria? Was there any was there a different experience of of COVID nineteen up in the north of the state? Yeah, look, it, it was and it, and it wasn't. In some regards, we weren't as heavily locked down as, as Melbourne, although we still were, were able to access the office and, and able to access or, or visit our customers. So. It was still um, very much sort of a lockdown type thing and managing homeschooling and all of those things as well. Um, I guess the, the thing that probably um, worked for, for myself was our little Victorian Tasmanian team. We've got some, and a couple of other regional managers in Victoria and a business development manager and, and one in Tassie at the time, and now we've got two. And we, we get, got together every week and we actually planned a series of workshops for businesses, 22 of them over over 22 weeks, but it enabled us to get together every week and discuss what you know some of the issues that we're having, uh, do some planning, and just um, I guess in some regards just have a bit of fun online. Obviously, all online, um, but it, it just enabled us to have that avenue to discuss things, but to talk about issues and talk about things that are happening, and help us get through that period. So I think that was really valuable. We've continued to do that, of course, and um, it's created a great little network and. With those webinars that we ran, uh, we also got other people, other um, 
parts of the APS involved in delivering some of those. So we're, we're connected into others in, in various mm. ways as well. So I think that was the real key. Mm. And certainly if there's one thing we've all learned over the course of the last 12 months, it's how to use technology in a different way. And um, you know, this is a prime example of that. Um, how to use technology differently and how to use it in a way which actually makes, has a real impact on our connections with each other. Um, so I think that's certainly from our perspective here at the APSC, that's been a, that's been a really valuable learning that's come out of the whole COVID situation. Um, Paul, I might just go back to you for uh, another question that's come in, which is about uh, the biggest, what's the biggest misconception that business owners have about the public service? Now, you actually mentioned before that you thought that by and large, they were pretty, they had a pretty positive attitude towards, <laughs> towards the APS and were trusted and, and due to that real, you know, the personal interaction and the support that you provide. But are there still misconceptions there that, that people have? Um, I guess the, the, the biggest one is that, that people think that uh, because we work with business that we've got a truckload of money and a blank check. Um, and I guess if you're looking at a misconception, that's probably the biggest one. Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think that's one. And the other one is probably that there are actually people out there that they can reach out to and, and talk to. Um, and they often don't, don't see that. Uh, particularly mm. now that we've you know, gone online and we've got one three numbers and webs and web addresses and portals and all sorts of things, I think they really value that that interaction and so that's a, that's good that they can have it, but they don't sometimes they don't actually realise that it's there. Mm. Actually I might I might slightly reshape that question and put it to David and Simone as well. Um, are you what do you think are some of the, the broader community misconceptions about the about the APS and what can we do or what should we be doing to try and address those? David, I might go to you first on that. Thanks, you could have given me some thinking time. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't know, I, mean, I think um, the community, it, to talk about community as, as a single thing is, is really difficult. Different people have different perceptions about the APS and they're, they're often driven by their own interactions. Um, and I, I think um, that if you wanted to take the most general misconception, it is that, um, you know, APS people don't work hard, for example, is one of those things that you often see going out in the, in the media or things like that. And and the truth is, is so much further from that. And I think that the public sector demonstrated that in particular through the COVID-19 thing and the way people pulled together and managed to continue to deliver work in, in incredibly different difficult circumstances. And certainly I, I'm aware that a number of our staff have worked incredibly long hours to get things done in really, really challenging environments and, and in very flexible ways. Okay, great. Simone, your thoughts on that one? I've given you, you've had longer yeah, to think than David. I, I have had longer to think, but I'm going to leverage off what David said because that was the thing that um, I thought might be a difference for me when I entered the APS. But I've been just astounded at, um, A, the capability um, that I can tap into that's embedded within the APS. It's really impressive. Um, the work ethic, I think that that was a misconception that maybe, you know, maybe just, yeah, that generalised, you know, you don't have to work as hard, you've got shorter days, um, you know, easier sort of set of employment terms and conditions. Um, no, the discretionary effort um, of our workforce in particular is just enormous. The commitment that they have um, to the mission and the vision and just delivering for Australians every day um, has just astounded me. So, you know, even my own personal bias has been corrected by coming into the APS and just seeing that really determined strong work ethic to get the right outcome. So, yeah, it's been really lovely, yeah. Mm, fantastic. So we've got a, a question here about flexible work and um, obviously that's something that uh, Mary, in her remarks, um, she touched on at some length. So I'd like to pick up on that. And um, the question is about how your agencies are managing flexible work post-2020. But I, I guess 
I'd be interested also in your perspective on, on what Mary mentioned regarding employee value proposition and the need to both attract but then also retain um, high performing staff and the, and the capabilities that the APS needs and, um, and then also the opportunities in terms of I guess labour markets that, that we can tap into if we have um, a, a much more significant investment in flexible work options. So, um, so David, maybe I'll go back to you on that one first. Sure. Um, so the ABS has long had very strong working from home practices um, and a large proportion of our workforce have taken that up over time. What COVID has done has extended um, the business lines in which we've been able to enable working from home. And um, in particular, so we have a contact centre here in Geelong and traditionally we thought that that wasn't possible to do and basically that was in part around technology and partially around cultural pieces. COVID-19 certainly forced that and we want to continue having those sorts of arrangements. But having said that, there's also recognition within the agency that um, working from home in, in totality or entirety is really problematic. So there are issues around how we induct people into the agency, how we um, build culture and develop culture, how people build networks, for example. So we've had staff joining us um, through the last year that have had not necessarily real trouble, but it's certainly been much more difficult for them than usual to connect with other people within the agency and build relationships. And um, I think most people recognise that work is based around relationships. So having said all that, um, as an organisation, we're looking very, very closely at um, what the outcomes are from working from home and how we can facilitate that in a way that suits both um, the ABS and our staff um, to get the best outcome. So that really does come down to being um, an employer of choice and that value proposition position for staff and for the agency and taking that into consideration. Hmm. Yeah, great. And uh, Paul, what's your, your perspective on that? I guess, um, Phil, that's probably not an area that um, I'm, an, I'm an expert in, um, being at the, I'm, I'm out here by myself and with, uh, with no staff, so I guess I'll leave that for now, I think, Phil. Okay, no worries. Simone? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Look, I think the hybrid workforce is the way to go. Um, you know, certainly from my perspective, I commuted for 10 years from Ballarat to Melbourne. Um, and, you know, the notion of being able to split that work week up and come in a couple of days a week, work from home a couple of days a week, I know that that's really relatable to a lot of people. And, you know, just the relocation of families and individuals to regional centres like Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, um, you know, you know, having a son in real estate, it's it's really evident that 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 growth is really taking off. So, look, I think you know a hybrid workforce is the only way to go going forward and to remain competitive. I think Mary's spot on that from a retention and attraction point of view, um, it's just going to be so important to get that digital equality across the board so that people can not be limited, can have that access and you know, work really effectively. But I would say that, um, you know, coming into the workplace after a long period of time, um, you know, we've got um, testimonials from people saying that it's been a really good thing, that actually, you know, it does afford that opportunity to collaborate, be a bit innovative, you know, come together in ways that you can't always do through Microsoft Teams or online. So, um, you know, I, I think a combination of both is really important. Mm, absolutely. Uh, another question um, relates to skills, new skills. So this is more of a personal reflection, I guess. What, what are some new skills that you have learnt during the course of your APS career? So we might, we might go to you for this one, Paul, in the first place. Yes, uh, I guess I've already probably had some strong IT skills, but um, obviously uh, we've learnt um, some some pretty interesting IT skills over the years to adapt. Um, I don't know if uh, if it's only our um, department, but we do have some issues. We've had some issues over the over the years, but um, I guess in the last eighteen months um, and before COVID, you know the uh, the web technologies and and um, having that ability to use your Zooms and WebExes and Skypes and Microsoft Teams. I think we've all learnt a lot. They were coming well before. Um, COVID came, but 
that was that in, the increased hype in that space. And certainly from an IT perspective, those skills have been fairly, fairly um, prominent. But I think the other thing is, is just the skills and understanding for me, in my perspective, is just understanding and being able to understand and, and um, build that rapport with, with businesses and, and really feel for where they're at and to be able to share that. And, and those people management skills from an external perspective rather than you know, managing staff, I think have been really, really valuable learnings that have, that have helped along the way. Excellent. Look, I might, I might put a follow-up question to you, which has come through on Slido. So there's a question there. Do you think public servants require private sector experience for a sex successful career? Now, I think the, the answer to that is, is probably no, simply because there are so many public servants who don't have private sector experience and yet have very successful careers. But I'd be interested in your perspective on, as someone who does work closely with business, your perspective on on that idea of you know having experience in multiple across multiple domains or multiple sectors, I, I really think it's it depends where you are and what what part of the public sector you um, you're working in. Hmm. Um, you know, that, I think it's a, a real key. But it, certainly in the role that we're in, I really think it helps absolutely to understand a little bit about business and and to be able to feel what they feel or have felt what they're feeling now and. Having that experience is really, really valuable in that in that part of the of the sector. But um, you know, in, in other areas, perhaps not so. But I think you have to always have a lens of what's happening out there in the community or what's happening out there in business. And so, when you are making you know making decisions or working on a project, you've got that lens that you know, really reflects back as to what's going on out there. So you might not. Uh, um, be in that same position or that same um, feeling that the, the client might have or the, the person in the public, but I think having that lens always is really important. Not to just focus on the APS sort of bubble, if that's not the right term, it probably sounds wrong, but you know, having a wider view when you're making decisions is really, really important to feel what the people are feeling. Yeah, okay, excellent. Thanks for that. Um, David, can we go back to that question about new skills, a new skill that you have, um, you've developed over the course of your career? Over the course of my career, many skills, I would have to say. Um, so like I said, I, I joined the APS as a graduate. Um, I did have private sector experience coming in, but I don't think that that's necessarily a critical driver in terms of um, progression. Um, so for me, there was a range of technical skills that I picked up along the way, both in terms of as a statistician, working more in the technology side of things, but probably um, the skill that I'm still working on and have developed over time is, is um, managing staff and leadership. So th they are constantly growth areas, I think, for us, um, and certainly for me, and um, really critical to performing well in the roles. Fantastic. And Simone? Thanks, Phil. Um, look, I, th I think it would be that IT literacy, but I think also connection to customer. That's something that, the, that I've really understood more deeply, um, having you know, joined the APS. I think, um, you know, that, that question around diversity of thought and, and experience around private coming into public and vice versa, yeah, all, all of that can add value, but ultimately um, it's that connection with the customer. And I think that um, particularly through COVID, um, really pushing hard, even if it's just the internal customer, to make that connection and, and partner really closely with business, um, that's definitely been strengthened for me. Um, in the last little while. So yeah, very grateful for that connection. Mm. And um, it's interesting how you, you, you and you all three emphasised um, the connection to that, ultra, that, that fundamental serving responsibility that the APS, that the APS has right across the breadth of the organisation. Um, so look, we're, we're almost out of time. There's a, there's a question um, that's come through about best advice and helpful tips for someone who is just starting out in the APS. I'm going to, we'll pick up on that theme, but I'm going to change it slightly and say, ask you what is one piece of advice that you would give your younger self early on in your APS career? You know, one piece of advice. What is one thing you wish you'd known back then that you know now, or one piece of advice you wish you'd had? So, um, 
maybe Simone, if you're able to go first on that. Mm. Well, of course, I've just joined. I guess the piece of advice might be to um, appreciate the mechanics of government. I mean, it's just something that you, you, it's just a rude awakening, I think, when you step into this space and you go, oh, gosh, that's what it's all about. That's why it takes the time it does and that's the process that's involved um, to really understand the mechanics of decision making and government. So I think it, it would be advice around listening uh, mm. and just observing and sitting back and taking that all in so that you can actually then learn to appreciate how things work and, and how, um, yeah, why things take um, time and the, and the process you need to work through to actually get the change. Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, David, what about you? Uh, well, for me, it was advice I actually received, which was um, if you're thinking about a career in the public sector, then the, it's recognising that the public sector values both breadth and depth. And to think of yourself as a public servant first and an employee of your agency second, and then thirdly, um, an employee within the particular work group you're in. So having that sort of hierarchy of thinking is quite important. And it certainly presents lots of opportunities to consider how you would develop breadth by moving at level, um, possibly to different agencies or within your agency, rather than just thinking about career as being a vertical stovepipe, which it isn't. Um, and just thinking about that sort of path is going to be problematic um, if you think you want to have a long-term career in the public sector. Mm. I think that's a really interesting insight. And I wish, in a sense, I wish we had time to unpack that a little bit more, because I think that's a, yeah, there's, there's a great deal of, of wisdom in, in that what you've just said, so thanks for that. Um, and Paul, for you, lastly, what's, what would be one piece of advice you would give your younger self? Well, I guess my younger self or anybody entering would be that while the opportunities are probably endless, um, that, you know, the APS has got so many different and diverse roles, find something that you really love um, within, the, within the organisation and really make sure that that's, that's what you're doing because it's, it can be a long and exciting career, but if you don't love it, it can be a, you know, just a, not that. So find something you love, follow your dream. Fantastic. And look, that's, I think that's a great, a great note to end the panel discussion on. So there were some other questions that came through we didn't have time to address, but we got through, we got through a, fair, a fair chunk of them. Thank you. A uh, big thank you to, um, to Paul and David and Simone for their time today. As I said at the outset, our aim was really to showcase both the diversity of roles and the common ethos of service that underpin a career in the APS, and I think that's certainly come through um, pretty clearly in, in the discussion that we've had. So a big thank you to the three of you for giving of your time so generously this morning. And, and thanks everyone, thanks also to everyone who's tuned in. Thanks to those who've asked questions. Thanks to everyone who's made the time to actually follow this State of the Service Roadshow event. Um, this is the first time, this year is the first time we've done this in an entirely virtual format. So um, we're very interested to hear feedback, to, to receive feedback. Everyone who registered for this event uh, will receive an eva a very short, about six questions evaluation a survey to complete later today, so please do take the time to fill that out. And lastly, before we close, just a heads up, I guess, that the APS as an institution has its own presence on social media, which you might not have been aware of. I've, there are some links which are coming up on the screen for our accounts on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. And I do encourage you to, to follow us if uh, if you're a social media type, please do follow us and keep up to speed on things that affect the whole of the service. So with that, um, thanks again. We're out of time, so we'll close it there. Enjoy the rest of your day.